Are you ready, Cody, or if we need to? Okay. Good evening. I'm going to start the meeting. The board has got some busy work to do before we come to the uh, hearing for this evening. If any of you here feel that you are likely to want to talk to the uh, application that is before the board this evening, on the lectern there is a sign-up sheet, and if you put your name down there, we will be able to accurately record it um, in, in the minutes and so on. So if you, you can take it from there or, and pass it around if that's the best thing to do. So I'm going to start by reading the required opening statement, uh, which reads as follows. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Princeton Zoning Board of Adjustment, being held on Wednesday, the 24th of February, 2016, at 7.30 p.m. in the municipal complex. Pursuant to Section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of the time and place of this regular meeting has been provided by prominently displaying the schedule of regular meetings on the official notice board in the municipal complex, and by transmitting a copy of the schedule to the Princeton Packet, Town Topics, the Trenton Times, the Trentonian, and to Comcast Cable of New Jersey, Inc. A copy was also filed with the clerk of Princeton. Would you call the roll for us, please, Claudia? Sure. Ms. Clayton? Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Colson? Yes. Ms. Farrington? Mr. Floyd? Yes. Ms. Rockstrom? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. Ms. Suri? Yes. Mr. Tenenbaum? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have uh, some uh, work to do to approve uh, minutes and resolutions and so on that were circulated to us. Uh, we'll do the minutes of the uh, November the 10th meeting, first of all. Uh, if there are any corrections that you believe are needed so that these accurately reflect what we did, you should mention them now. Uh, if you're satisfied with it, I would like to accept a motion uh, to accept them as written or modified, and then a seconder for that motion. I move approval of the minutes. We November, have a motion November to 10th. accept as presented. I second. And a second to that motion. Could you call the roll then, for the please? Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Floyd? Yes. Ms. Rockstrom? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. Thank you. Um, the next uh, item here is item four, which is the annual report. Uh, it's traditional for the board to send a report to the council every year indicating all of the things we've done. Um, my view of this is that it appears to be accurate as well as I can remember, given that I've got Alzheimer's and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, if uh, you believe these are accurate, then uh, we can have um, a voice vote uh, to um, get them passed on to the council. So I'd like a motion during a second for that. Let me make you some space. I, I move. You, you will accept. We have a motion to accept as presented. Is there a second to that motion? Second. We have a motion and a seconder. Would you call the roll just to make sure? Ms. Clayton? Um, it's for the document that we send to the council. Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Colson? Yes. Mr. Floyd? Yes. Ms. Rockstrom? Ms. Rockstrom? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. Ms. Suri? Yes. Mr. Tenenbaum? Yes. Thank you. Good. 
Now we have two resolutions uh, of memorialization. The first one is the One Orchard Circle, which carries the number Z1515292V. Uh, this was a C2 for a side yard setback and so on for a garage. So if they're acceptable, a motion to approve as presented. Modifications are needed. We should make them now. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. A motion to approve and a seconder. Uh, uh, council will have to um, for those who can vote to vote. Ms. Clayton? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Colson? Yes. Mr. Floyd? Yes. Ms. Rockstrom? Yes. Ms. Suri? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. And the second of these uh, is the uh, 299 uh, Walnut Lane, which carries the number Z1515304V. I make a motion to accept. There's a motion to accept? A second. Is there a seconder to that motion? We have a seconder to the motion. So if you could call the roll of eligible voters. I have a Ms. Clayton? Yeah. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Colson? Yes. Mr. Floyd? Yes. Ms. Rockstrom? Yes. Ms. Suri? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. Okay. So the busy work is over. And now we get to uh, the application for this evening which is uh, West Windsor Real Estate uh, concerning 176 to 188 Bayard Lane. And this carries the number Z1414107MS. And um, what I would like to do uh, before I ask counsel to open the case for himself is to get Mr. Solo, I believe, uh, to read the essence of the memorandum uh, that uh, was submitted to the board so that it's properly on record. Chairman Royce, I'll just note that the noticing is in order and the board has jurisdiction to hear the application. Rabbit, you always win. And Mr. So, I'll swear you and you swear from your testimony this evening will be truthful. I do. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. What I'd like to do as the chair indicated is just give you a brief summary of some of the staff comments on the application. I'm going to be using this exhibit. This was a revised plan submitted by the applicant. It's labeled sheet five of eight. Preliminary final major subdivision site development plan. Um, this is a preliminary final major subdivision site plan with use variances. As the chair indicated, it is for property designated as 176 to 188 Bayard Lane and consists of three lots. Um, the three lots are 1.7 acres in total. Lot 46, designated on the tax map, has an existing dwelling on it. Lots 44 and 45 are vacant. Currently, lot 46, which is the larger lot, this doesn't relate to that, um, is one acre in size. Lot 45 is about 0.45 acres, and lot 44 is about 0.23 acres. Um, the lots are wooded. They gently slope up uh, to the southeast corner of the site. Let me orient everybody to the map, because I'm now going to speak a little bit about the application. Uh, to the left and upwards is north at the top of the map, Bayard Lane. All the way over on the right is Lee Avenue, Birch Avenue. Wilson Avenue is down here in the right corner. Um, Duffield Place and Mountain Avenue off to the left. Um, this is the bend on Bayard Lane that goes up to Mountain Avenue. There's a small wetlands area associated with the site. It may be a little hard to see. I've highlighted or outlined it in a green dashed line. 
um, that wetland area will be filled as part of the development. The surrounding uses um, for this site are a variety of different uses. There are single family residences on Duffield Place, townhouses down by Mountain Avenue to the north. There's a bank, some office buildings, and a gas station to the east, and then primarily single family dwellings to the south and west, the south to the bottom and the west. West to the, to the left. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the applicant is proposing to consolidate the three lots that I spoke of and then resubdivide them into three roughly equal sized lots. And now I'm going to refer to them here. Proposed lot 46.01 will contain 24,474 square feet. That's the lot here, shown in, in black. Uh, proposed lot 46.02 will contain 24,496 square feet, the middle lot, and then the third lot will be 40, is proposed lot 46.03 and contain 24,689 square feet. So they're roughly half acre lots. Um, on each of the lots is proposed a duplex unit. Um, the duplex will be approximately 5,275 square feet or roughly 2,700 square feet for each unit. I've colored on the drawing in tan each of the duplex units, and you can see the line dividing each of the uh, duplex units themselves. Um, the revised plan calls for one driveway out to Baird Lane for all three units. So up at the top, you'll see there's a access drive colored in gray, driveways from each of the duplex units and then one driveway out to Baird Lane. The original plan had two driveways um, at the recommendation of SPRAB and the land use engineer. They've gone with just one driveway out. The proposed access drive is approximately 20 feet in width. It's proposed to be constructed with a pervious pavement material. A four foot wide sidewalk, concrete sidewalk, will be provided along the entire frontage of the site. There is a detention basin associated with this development, and that's to the <coughs> west or at the bottom of the drawing shown here in this rough area. It encroaches on two of the lots um, that are there. The property is located in the former township's R5 zone, which permits single family homes on lots of 21,780 square feet or roughly a half acre. Uh, the duplexes or two families are not permitted in the zone and a use variance has been requested um, to permit the duplexes. In terms of the use variance itself, you'll see in, in my report, we've asked the applicant to provide testimony to the board uh, that the requested use variance carries out the purposes of zoning. It's often referred to, as you know, as the special reasons or that an undue hardship exists for this particular property. In addition to the special reasons, we've asked the applicant to demonstrate that the requested variance can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and will not substantially impair the intent and purpose of the zone plan and the zoning ordinance, or what's commonly referred to as the negative criteria. There was a rider attached to the application um, to the use variance, and the applicant has provided some generalized testimony regarding those standards, and we've asked that he specifically address the current site. By way of this particular application, we've asked the applicant to indicate why this location is unique, provide some testimony on the uses in the area. Um, as most of you know, the southbound side of Bayer Lade is primarily single family with the northbound, so the area up above, um, a mixture of residential, non-residential, and some multifamily housing. <clears throat> We've asked that they provide additional testimony on the building scale and how it would fit in with the surrounding neighborhood. The duplex structures, as I indicated, <coughs> excuse me, are approximately 5,000 square feet in area. Uh, we'd like to hear some testimony of how does that fit with the character and scale of the neighbor, neighboring properties and does it make aesthetically um, a natural fit. We've asked them how the granting of the variance will promote uh, the purposes of zoning. Um, 
We've asked that all testimony focus just on this particular lot and not be generalized in terms of here's what the land use law says and we're complying. Uh, do have a couple comments for you on the negative criteria. <clears throat> we suggest that the board evaluate the detriment to the public good or the variances affect on the surrounding properties and neighborhood. Specifically, staff is concerned with the size and mass of the proposed structures and the overall increase in density. As you know, the existing um, zoning allows one house on a half acre lot. That's basically two dwelling units per acre. The applicant is proposing 3.5, as well as the use variance um, to permit two families in a single family zone. Um, we did not find any support in the master plan or the zoning ordinance um, where it contemplated an increase in density nor for the use of two families where one families are permitted. Um, there are a couple of slight comments in my report and Mr. Bridger and Mr. West's report. I'm just going to briefly summarize some of those. Um, Jack or Derek, if I miss anything, maybe at the end you can um, remind me. Uh, first, um, just for the, for the board's information, 40 existing trees will be removed to facilitate construction of the site. The applicant is proposing to plant 40 new London plane trees. Um, there are a number of suggestions regarding landscaping, the first being that um, a greater variety of the trees uh, type should be proposed. We're trying to avoid a, a monoculture here in Princeton, so we'd like to see a few more varieties mixed in with the, the 40 um, London plane trees. We've also asked that um, there be, if the board approves the plan, foundation planting plans for each of the duplexes be submitted for review and approval. It's something t typically done um, by an applicant when they come in with other than single family homes. Um, we've suggested that they include planting area between the driveways. As you look at the plan, you can see the driveway, driveway, there's an area um, for planting. We, we'd like um, some separation between the driveways and to soften the, the appearance at the street. Uh, we've suggested that the shade trees along Bayard should be 30 feet on center instead of the 40 feet on center proposed. Uh, that additional fencing or a more substantial buffer be provided along the property lines where it abuts residential property. Uh, the municipal land use engineer has reviewed the stormwater plan. Um, it's a uh, typical detention basin. It's located to the rear of lots 4601 and 4602. And again, that's in this general area here. Um, it will discharge in the, would be the northwest corner of the site. Um, both the engineer and the board stormwater consultant has uh, reviewed the plan. They have a number of technical changes that they'd like to uh, see be made if the board chooses to approve this application. Those should be made a condition of the approval. Um, we've also suggested that the applicant consider reducing the width of the frontage drive. Currently, this drive is about 20 feet in width. We're suggesting 16 feet, which is a little narrow, but again, there's not going to be a lot of traffic on, on this. There are a total of six homes, and you're really talking about four um, that would cover probably um, two-thirds of, of the width. So we'd like to reduce the impervious coverage as much as possible. Um, the site plan wasn't clear if the concrete sidewalk that's proposed matches on both ends, particularly on the northern end. With the existing sidewalk uh, for pedestrian safety, we'd like to make certain that they will match up. We've asked the applicant in my report that they should, uh, they did submit a green building checklist. We'd like them to briefly discuss with the board some of the green building technologies that they would be incorporating into the structures. Um, a technical note, there was a previous subdivision that goes back a number of years on this site. If this application is approved with the new subdivision, that needs to be formally removed. Um, you also should have received a number of comments from the Site Plan Review Advisory Board, SPRAB. We've asked that the applicant address each of those comments. They have a, a lot of recommendations regarding the actual structures themselves. That's a summary, Derek or Jack, did I leave out anything you wanted to highlight? Uh, Mr. West, Mr. <coughs> Bridger, do you swear or affirm your testimony this evening will be truthful? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And uh, Lee, you did cover everything. 
I don't know if the board has questions for me or the other staff before we turn it over to the applicant. If not, there thank you. There to be no questions from the board at this time. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> finally. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Christopher DeGrezia from the law firm of Drinker, Biddle, and Reef here on behalf of the applicant, West Windsor Real Estate LLC. As Lee mentioned, the application before you this evening is to allow the construction of three duplexes on three lots located on 206. The applicant owns um, three lots on Bayard, and two of them are vacant. One has a non-conforming uh, residential structure. The application is basically to redraw the lot lines, and I know Lee just mentioned that there was a previous app, uh, subdivision before the planning board which redrew the lot lines. Um, that was never perfected. I think it's still valid for a little while under the Permit Extension Act, but that's, that will be, um, if the board likes this application, we would certainly throw away those approvals. Um, the problem with the R5 zone is that it only is, allows single family houses. This property does not fall within the zone. It's on the outer edge and the farmost corner. It is very unique in that it's, it's the only property located across from the service zone. When we took a look at this particular property, we found that because of the characteristics, because of the property, right on 206 with the truck traffic in the traffic, the community park, this, the gas station, um, what's there, gas station, there's Princeton Bank, there's this Shell, and then I guess that's the restaurant. They're the only properties that stare right across the street at those, that the single family home wasn't really appropriate. And this site would be much more better suited to like a mixed uh, multifamily development or as we're proposing here, duplexes. And the reason why we focused in on duplexes is because we could create them in a way where they would be of the same mass and scale as single family homes. So we're not going to have any negative impacts. And we'll get into the details, but just simple numbers. If we had three lots, they're fully conforming, and they are, we can build three homes as of right. And those homes would be three, I mean, 5,000 square feet. Instead of building three 5,000 square feet homes with five bedrooms, we're building um, three duplexes. Each one of the units in the duplexes are 2,500 square feet. So in terms of scale and look, we've really tried to make these appear with the same mass and volume as would a single family home in, in, um, in the zone. Um, in fact, we were at SPRAB for two hearings, not just one, and we spent a good amount of those hearings going through materials, architectural elements, roof lines, all of these little details, and to make it look like when you're driving by, they're not supposed to look exactly like single family homes because they're not, but to give the appearance, if you're driving by quickly, that, you know, from an intensity standpoint, you're looking at a single family home. Um, and we'll get to the elevations in a little bit and I hope those details come out. So saying that, I think that I would like to have my first witness come up, who is our engineer. This is Jeff Brown. And I'd like to have him sworn in and provide some testimony. Uh, do you want to use that mic? Mr. Brandy, sir, for your testimony this evening, will be truthful. I do. Thank you. <coughs> Jeff um, is a licensed engineer. He's appeared before. The, you've appeared before the zoning board, right? I know you've been yes, before the yes, zoning board. Yes, I've appeared before times. the zoning board. We like to pr propose. Mr. Chair, uh, Archie Reed, 26 Westcott Road. I'm here representing myself. Uh, what is your procedure for the examination? 
Uh, I would suggest, since I believe we do have you here, Mr. Reed, and Ms. Studholm, um, probably the most expeditious way to do this would be uh, as each witness testifies. If you have cross-examination you'd like to make, that would be the time to do it. Okay. Is that all right with the board to do it that way? Okay. Um, so we'd like to have um, Jeff Brown um, presented as a professional engineer. And um, should he run through his qualifications, or is he acceptable? Briefly. OK. Uh, I'm a licensed. Have you appeared before this I, I have appeared before the zoning board in Princeton. We and certified you once. It should last forever. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and he's also licensed in state. Jeff, can you take us through, um, you heard a little bit of my intro, can you take us through where the property is and um, then take us through the development plan? Sure. Um, where is north on your map? Uh, okay. It always uh, used to point upwards when I was young. Well, it, it points upwards and slightly yeah. to the left. Um, should we mark this exhibit? Yes. A1, I guess. A1. Sorry, could you just... When you speak into the mic, could you really speak into the mic? Because there's a lot of ambient noise tonight. It's a little bit hard to hear. OK. Thanks. A1 is a plan entitled Zoning Board Exhibit uh, Tax Slash Zoning Map. And it's dated uh, February 23rd, 2016. Uh, the subject lots, which are lots 44, 45, 46 in black 6802 are shown in green, uh, roughly in the center of this plan, and contain 1.69 acres located on the southwesterly side of Byard Lane, State Highway 206, in the R5 zoning district. Um, and as has been stated, this is an application for a preliminary and final major subdivision and site plan and use variance approval. Uh, two of the three existing lots uh, are non-conforming in lot area, and the proposed resubdivision, consolidation and resubdivision will reallocate the lot area between the three lots to make three new fully conforming lots. Uh, there's no bulk variances associated with the subdivision, uh, or in fact with the site plan. Uh, the only variance uh, that we're seeking is the use variance for the duplex units. Uh, the existing, there is an existing non-conforming dwelling uh, at the southeast corner of the lot, which will be demolished as part of this application. Um, what I'd like to do is just go through uh, what we originally submitted on this project, our site plan, and then take you through just some of the changes that we made as a result of uh, our discussions with SPRAB. Jeff, before you take that exhibit down, can you leave that for a second? I just want to point out a couple of things because it may be a little bit difficult to see from where the board is sitting in the audience. So as you identified the lot right here in green, um, and then moving this way is the R5 zone. So here's the property, and it's located along the Highway 206. And as I mentioned earlier, the S2 is right across the street. This square rectangle shape is the extent of the S2 zone. Behind it is the R9. This is the zone that has uh, the bank, the gas station, and the restaurant. And our, over here where it says R4, and I guess the staff can, could correct yeah. me. Mr. DeGrezzi, I'm going to ask a favor. Can, yeah. can you ask these as questions? OK. Um, well, I just want to correct this first. The R4, and I guess the staff can comment, I think that's the MX zone now, because Starting at this corner is the um, Stanworth Merwick development that has 326 odd units that are all multifamily townhomes, stacked houses, whole mix of multifamily. So it's not all R4 here. So you have a corridor of intense multifamily units there. You got the S2 and then the highway with the community park. Jeff, so as I described that, and you're looking at the, um, the chart, do you agree with those, those comments? Yes, I do. And over here is also a townhouse development of something like 13 units, which is also you know, a townhouse multifamily development along 206 on that side. 
So I just wanted to clarify because it was, you know, part of identifying the area. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, I'll, I'll mark the second exhibit, A2. And A2 is just entitled Zoning Board Exhibit, and it's dated September 2nd, 2015. Uh, this was the, basically, the original site layout uh, that we submitted uh, with our application to the Zoning Board. Uh, it shows the three duplex units uh, served by uh, two driveway systems, uh, one system with access off of 206 serving just the southerly unit, and a common driveway serving the two northerly units uh, on the site. All, all of the driveways shown on this plan, the, the, the main stem of the driveway at least, is, is shown as 10 feet wide. Um, as a result of our first meeting with the SPRAB, uh, we, we revised the plan to have just a single access point, uh, which is the southerly access point as shown on this exhibit. Um, and we revised the, uh, the common driveway to be uh, 20 feet wide to accommodate two-way traffic. Um, we also added, and I'll introduce another exhibit here. <laughs> so, so at SPRAB, we talked about one of the benefits while well, he's changing that. You are presenting a case to us. It's fascinating to see what you did before, but we'd like to see what you're bringing this evening. Yes, and he's going to bring that up next. time is precious to all of us. Okay, um, so as a result of the first meeting, we eliminated one of the access points to 206, expanded the driveway to, to 20 feet wide, um, and we added some sidewalks uh, to the front of the building in accordance with some of uh, the SPRAB's comments. There were also some minor changes to the architecture which are reflected in a slightly revised footprint. We then returned to SPRAD with this plan, which resulted in the plan that we're now proposing. Mr. Brown, is that Exhibit A3? Uh, yes, this will mark A3. And what, what is it called? What we might have done. Uh, this plan is called Zoning Board Exhibit Site Development Plan Revision 1, and it's dated February 23rd, 2016. I don't think you've seen this one. Okay, and this plan now is, is what we're currently proposing. Um, we have maintained the single access from 206. We've reduced the width of the driveway from 20 feet to 16 feet in accordance with uh, Sprab's comments. We've added some sidewalks coming from the sidewalk on Baird Lane into the site, one at, at basically each end of the driveway. And we've reconfigured the walkways going into the units to separate them so that each unit has its own driveway leading from the uh, respective uh, Toward the, more toward the garage of each, each unit. Um, by, by reduce, when we reduced the size of the driveway, we did pull it further from 206 to give a little bit more green space uh, in the front of the lots, which was, which was one of the zoning or the SPAB's concerns. Um, as Lisa mentioned, the site does slope gently. Uh, from the southeast to the northwest uh, and there, to a swale that exists at the northeast corner of the site. Uh, stormwater management will be handled uh, by a number of uh, measures. Uh, we are proposing 
course pavement for all of the driveway, which would be underlain by a stone storage bed. Uh, water from that storage bed would flow out uh, through an outlet structure um, and a pipe system to the detention basin in the rear, and then would flow to an outlet structure in the detention basin, which would uh, slow the flow as it goes into the ditch at the northwest corner of the site. There is a wetland in that area as well? Pardon me? A the, I was, I thought uh, we were told there was a wetland somewhere on that oh, there, property. Right, I'll, and I'll mention that, well, I'll, I'll talk about it right now. There is a wetlands uh, that straddles um, lots two and three. Um, and there, there had been, under the prior approval, a permit from NJDEP and an LOI, and the permit would permit filling of that isolated wetlands. Um, the LOI for that is still valid under the Permit Extension Act, but the permit has expired because they are not extended by the Permit Extension Act. So in order to implement this plan, we will have to renew that permit. Jeff, um, in comparison to putting uh, three three homes, three as of right homes. Um, would the detention change in any way? Uh, no, because the improvements would basically be the same as um, has been mentioned. The size of the duplex units is the same size that would be permitted as a single family unit. So really, uh, the impervious surface would be <coughs> pretty much the same uh, under a single family. Actually, with a single family, there might be more patios and pool areas and so forth in the rear yards, which may actually result in a little bit more impervious surface. And just for the record, the lots themselves fully conform to all the zoning standards in terms of area, width, depth, frontage for the, you know, all that. Yes, yeah, so all the box standards are met. And that the, the duplexes also meet all of the standards that would be applicable to the single family home in terms of FAR, impervious. Yes, yes. They, they meet the FAR and the uh, impervious coverage standards and all of the setback requirements. So, so the, one of the differences that you were talking about if this was a single family home rather than a duplex would be that there would be three separate driveways going to, to uh, Two or six, is that correct? Right. If these were single family homes, then uh, I would expect that each would have its own driveway out on the, on the 206 uh, rather than the shared driveway. That was actually one of the considerations of the spread um, in suggesting that we actually combine it into one driveway. They thought that that was a much better solution than having multiple driveways on the 206. You know, one of the benefits of us going to a shared approach with a duplex was to able to cut out some of those driveways. So our original plan, instead of three accesses as what you would have with a single family home, we were able to put uh, two of the lots on a shared driveway and one. And Sprad really, really liked that idea and thought in terms of safety, having a single access point would be a really significant plus for this project. It's not the type, like if, if you have single family homes and fully conforming lots, there's an expectation that you have your own driveway and it's, it's a big difference to have a shared driveway on a single family lot. With duplexes and multifamilies, there's an expectation that the, the facilities are shared, so it wouldn't be an issue with a duplex type development. Um, I've marked this exhibit A4, and this exhibit is entitled Zoning Board Exhibit Site Development Plan Revision 2, and it also has a date of February 23rd, 2016. I just have one more exhibit. What do we mark this A5? A5. Thank you. A5 is also dated February 23rd, 2016, and it's entitled Zoning Board Exhibit Revised Landscaping Plan. Um, Mr. Solo went through some of the landscaping concerns of staff and the spread, and what we've tried to do is accommodate those concerns with this plan. Uh, we've added uh, a lot more uh, 
shrubbery along the frontage, uh, some evergreen shrubbery to screening units from uh, Bayard Lane. Um, we've added uh, landscaping between the units, uh, which was one of the suggestions. And we've just in general added a lot more density um, in the landscaping. Uh, there were several comments in the reports that uh, this, this application, if approved, should be conditioned on uh, satisfying your landscape consultant and your arborist, which we would certainly uh, be willing Where to do. Where is the driveway exit on there? Pardon me? The Where is the driveway exit? Uh, the driveway is right here. You've got a decent sight triangle there. There's a 45 degree sight triangle at the end. Uh, it appears to have a lot of plantings, which if it obscures right. the traffic but, on Bayard is... But I believe they're far enough back that they would not affect the site triangle, but that's something we would take a look at it when we finalize the plan with your consultants. And by, by using the shared driveway, isn't it true that we're able to create a much larger buffer here between right. the residential uses and the across the street? Uh, right. you, you would have the breaks that you would have with three driveways. Thank you. Do we have any question? No. Another witness? Um, you, you mentioned that there's less impervious surface because there's just one driveway. If well, you were... I, I didn't say less. I said I thought it would be roughly equivalent because... Oh. But then if you had three driveways. Well, with the three driveways, you would eliminate this cross driveway, but you'd have additional driveways going out to the street. So it would be roughly the same. I guess what I'm wondering is if you have done the math on since each of those duplexes has a two-car garage and I'm not sure that you'd have a single family home with a four-car garage what the uh, difference is in that uh, have, there, there could be slightly more but it, it, it we are proposing porous pavement anyway so it's not truly impervious surface anyway and, and we do have storm you won't have, storage. You won't have would that be within the garage you would have porous pavement no, no the, the driveway itself would be porous pavement. Right. I think the garages might be taking more, up more space, but I don't know. I, um, it's just well, it's the, a question. The, the garages that are calculated as part of the floor area ratio, and these, these units comply with the floor area ratios that would apply to a single family dwelling. Are you, so, speaking, are you speaking to traffic in your presentation, or is no. that somebody else? No. No. Okay. As, uh, as part of your testimony, and I realize you were kind of led into it, there was this concept that townhouses don't normally have their own driveways. This setup could be set up with single family homes. Isn't that correct? It, but you, it, it you could be, be yeah. having a lot of cross easements with that. You could, right. you could set that up with single-family homes. Yes, these, these lots could be single-family homes. There's no denying that. Yes, with a common driveway and one exit. In, in, it's it's exit. just not typical to do that with single-family homes the way it is with multifamily. Is it typical to do that with townhouses? Well, a lot of times townhouses have shared parking or... Um, shared driveways. So yes, I would say it is a lot more, do, more typical but for a majority. Don't. Uh, I, I don't really know the answer to that. I would think probably oh. a majority do, but I don't know for a fact. I don't know. I've, I've been in housing development finance for 29 years, and we financed a lot of townhouses. So I don't know that I agree with that. Have a question? I, I did have a question about the wetlands, the 4,500 wetland area that's going to be filled in. Yes. Is my understanding correct that you already have the permission from NJDP to fill that in no matter which project you go with? So it's not well, really. Well, we did have a permit to fill that in. Okay. That permit uh, was issued in 2007 and has now expired. We'll have to renew our permit. 
um, in order to build this project, but it, it does qualify for a statewide general permit number six for filling in isolated wetlands. So you'd be planning to fill it in no matter what? Uh, we pretty so much have to, get the to to get our detention basin, and it, it really is kind of a lawn area now anyway. I, I mean, if you go out there, it doesn't really look much different than the rest of the lot. But I thought there were setbacks associated with wetlands and that they were protected. So I'm a little bit confused well, about the idea that you might get a permit to fill it in um, and also that you would build so close to the existing wetland because I've had experience with wetlands where there's been a, where there's been you know, sort of a buffer zone right, on the wetland and you can't build within that buffer zone. Well, a wetland, if it's an intermediate wetland, would have a buffer zone, but there are permits, general permits, from DEP that you can get to fill them, and when you fill the wetlands, the buffer goes away. So, so from a legal standpoint, there's two types of uh, permits you can get for wetlands, special permits and general permits. Uh, the general permits outline specific as of right things, such as if you have a small pocket or a not, uh, you know, based on the quality, the identity of the wetlands and the size, you have an as of right permit to fill in a small area that's not connected or is not of a higher classification value. And that's the case here where there's a small isolated wetlands. There's a general permit that we were able to get and we would be able to get it again because it's an as of right permit. It's not where you have a long wetland area or something that's environmentally sensitive where you would require buffering or a transition area. It's not that type of wetland. Area. Except you're so close to mountain lakes, I'm, I'm confused that you think this is a detached wetland, especially with the C1 running so close. I mean, there's tons of it, it, property it, it, in, this, in this neighborhood alone here and you know, all the way up around Mountain Lakes, it is in the C1. I don't think you are here, I guess, but um, it does surprise me that you're not taking these wetlands very seriously. Mr. Brown, I'm just going to ask, Mr. DeGressi has made a series of statements about these uh, uh, wetland types of permits. Are you confirming his testimony or are you going to offer your own testimony? Because Mr. DeGressi is not testifying. Yep. You are, so... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with everything that he said. Um, this particular wetlands is, has been classified by DEP in the letter of interpretation as an isolated wetlands. It does qualify for a GP6 and uh, should be, there should be really no problem getting that. It's not connected to any other wetlands um, in the area. Are the, are the guidelines, do, we, do you know if the guidelines for granting that permit are the same as they were in 2007 or whenever you got it you said I think you said you got it in 2007 yeah I, I didn't get it but it was obtained in 2007 and to my knowledge the regulations have not changed you've anymore. looked at it yes so it's they are the same they have not yes. gotten stricter yes it's still it's still a GP6 an isolated wetlands fill let's try and proceed Thank you. Um, did you want to meet for me to bring up the next witness, or don't you? Okay. No, I thought. Oh, I no, thought no, 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 Mr. Chair, we have attorneys present who want to do cross examination. Yeah, I thought they had said something about cross examining before the you next. You wish to cross examine? Okay, then let's let's do that after each witness. We can do it that way. Okay. Uh, do you, does the chair have a preference as to who goes first? Because Archie said I can go first. <laughs> Ann Studholm, the law firm of Post Pollock, Goodsell, and Straukler. I am representing four of the neighbors in the immediately adjacent single family neighborhood. I'm representing Darren and Anissa Mealy of 49 Wilson Road, and I'm representing John Buford and his wife, Gina Lee, of 39 Wilson. They unfortunately are experiencing a death in the family. His father is dying right now, as I understand, in Ohio. So they're not here tonight. If this continues, I expect them to come. Um, Anissa and Darren are here tonight. I expect to put them on as witnesses. Um, a few of the questions that I'm going to have uh, for Mr. Brown are a little bit predicated on some of the testimony that you'll hear later. I'd ask Mr. Brown to be either bear with me or say, well, hypothetically, if your witness will testify that that's true, I'll answer the question. Um, so I realize I need to correct this. They're at 39. 
and I can start if you're all ready to have me start. Okay. Mr. Brown, hi. Um, could you speak into the mic? You don't need a mic. Speak into the mic. We need to get you on the record. Is that still working? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, the first question I had for you was about pervious pavement. My understanding, and Jack can correct me if I'm wrong, is that pervious pavement used to be considered impervious for a reason that I'm going to ask Mr. Brown about in a minute. Is that still the case in the new Princeton? I'm, I'm not sure I follow what the, the question pervious, is. Pervious pavement, it's a type of essentially tar or concrete no, that I, has No, I porous. understand what that is, but... He, well, it used to be considered impervious for calculations, for impervious calculations, and there's something Mr. Brown just said led me to believe that possibly he'd used it as calculating it as as not impervious well it's, it's it was used as part of their stormwater management but they are showing that with that and the storage that's underneath it they're providing the storage necessary for the for the storm and then and the overflow from that goes into the detention basin right I so I have two questions my first question is when you calculated the amount of impervious on this project did you include that pervious pavement or not I included a portion of the per, a percentage of the pervious pavement. In Can you tell me what ordinance. percentage you included and why you included that percentage? I believe it's seventy-five percent. Let me just check on that. Yes, I included seventy-five percent as impervious. And can you say, tell us why? Uh, because that's my understanding of the definition in the ordinance. In in our ordinance, in, in, in the current. Um, former township ordinance, there is a provision that, that uh, porous or semi-pervious pavement, you, there's a 25% reduction as in impervious surface. So that's okay. where the 75% pervious comes from. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to guess, Mr. Brown, but can you confirm that one of the features of pervious pavement is that it is not as fully pervious as an unpaved area, lawn, for example, soil? Uh, no, I can't confirm that. I believe it's more pervious. Well, I know I shouldn't perhaps have said lawn. Um, are you of the opinion that grass causes runoff and therefore? Yes, it definitely okay. causes runoff. And so, therefore, you're of the opinion and you're testifying that a 75% pervious is more absorptive than a grass surface. You just said well, that. Well, it's, it's not 70. You're confusing the ordinance definition of impervious with the actual perviousness There's a reason the they pavement. have that, though. I mean, I can ask Jack about that. Your, uh, okay, your, pervious, but your pervious pavement that you're, let's do it this way. Your pervious pavement that you're proposing. Yes. Our ordinance says you only get to reduce its imperviousness by 25%. Correct. Right. So is it your position that grass is, say, 80, 90% impervious, and yours is 75%? You just said that yours no, is that, better that's, than grass. that's not my position at all. Okay. So it's not your position that your pavement is better than grass? No, that is my position. That is but, your position. But not with the numbers that you just stated. Okay. What? 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 If, if tar is 100 and you're at 75, what's grass? No, we're not at 75. Again, you're confusing the definition of impervious surfaces with the actual runoff okay. value for the impervious surfaces. I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going to ask Jack later on why the ordinance says 75%. I'll ask you now. Compared with tar or you know, a concrete impervious sidewalk, how pervious is the proposed pavement here? Um, it's it's slightly more pervious than lawn. Slightly more than lawn, but can you? And, and in, in calculating the stormwater, we're considering it completely impervious because all of the water that falls on it is going to go into the stone storage bed underneath. So, in calculating the runoff, we're considering it completely impervious. Now, when you say it's all going to go into the storage bed underneath, um, yes. this pervious surface. Is this the, the kind that needs maintenance to clear its pores out? Yes. And how frequently does it need to be maintained? Uh, I believe you're supposed to vacuum it every three months. Ah. And what type of vacuum do you have to use for that? Uh, there are vacuum trucks that, that can be used. They, you 
should power wash them and then vacuum them with a vacuum so, truck. So you're going to have power washing and vacuum trucks yes, for part of all of that area every three months. Yes. And if that weren't done, how quickly would the system fail? I, I can't give you an exact answer on that, but I know that there are a lot of pervious pavement areas that are not maintained regularly and that still function just fine. There are a lot that functions just fine. Are there yes. some that aren't maintained and that don't function? Uh, not to my knowledge. Not but, to your knowledge. But there could be. Uh, none, none that I've been involved with. But the manufacturer recommends vacuuming and no, power washing no, every three months. No, the state DEP requires that it requires as part that. of the maintenance plan for porous pavement. Ah, but there's some people who don't follow the state DEP requirement? You just said some people don't do it. Uh, correct. Some people don't follow those standards. Oh. Um, okay, can, can I ask you about the detention basin? Since we have a lot of laymen here, can you explain the difference between a retention basin and a detention basin for everyone? Sure, a retention basin would hold water on a permanent basis, would have a standing pool of water in it. A detention basin would normally be dry except when it's actually raining and it fills up with water and then it would drain after the storm and be a dry area again. Can you tell us on this basin as designed, and I know this is as designed with the, the average rainfall, um, how deep would it tend to be and how long will it take for it to drain? Um, this basin is roughly two feet deep at its deepest point and would drain, I can't give you the exact time, but it would be less than 72 hours. So about three days. Well, that's it, less, less than three days. I can't tell you exactly how much the number. Is. Um, some people are both planners and engineers. Are you a planner by any chance? Yes. Oh, you are. Okay, a PP? Uh, yes, but I'm not testifying as a planner today. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask, is, is, Chris, do you have a planner here? Yes, we do. Somebody? Okay. I'm going to ask a question. I think these are engineering questions, but if you think they're planning questions, just let me know. And if you can't answer them, let me know, and we'll okay. save them for the planner. Okay. So, um, I read, we didn't have the benefit of having this most recent plan. We had the, the plan in the packet is what was filed before with the two <coughs> driveway exits. Um, and one of the things I read was that the application said that each of the six units would accommodate 3.5 automobiles. And I presume that that was two in the garage and one and a half out on average outside it. Is that correct? That's correct. So are, are you capable of calculating um, the maximum number of cars that could be expected on this development as proposed. Well, well those, that three and a half cars per unit is calculated under the residential site improvement standards. And um, I believe that exceeds what is required by the residential site improvement standards for a three bedroom unit. I think, I believe only two and a half are required, but again, I'm, I'm not really here to testify on that, so. But, but you but, are but proposing. But it, de it definitely meets the, uh, the residential site improvement standards. And, and 3.5 times 6 is 21, right? Yes. Yes. As an engineer, you can testify to that. Um, Chris, do you have a traffic guy here? Um, no. Oh. Um, so I'm, I'm actually interested in the stacking of potentially 21, possibly more like 15 cars going in and out that one driveway. In the morning, we're going to hear some testimony about the surrounding intersections and how it's already a long wait. Are you, are you capable of testifying to the maneuvering and that sort of traffic mechanics? Um, the mechanics, yes, but not the number. I mean, to have 15 or 20 cars sitting in that driveway, I think, is, would be incredible. I, I think so, too. Um, <laughs> um, so on the, on the wetland, um, you testified that the, the LOI is still good. The, wet, the permit itself has expired. You'd go for a general permit. Um, so that permit from 2007, do you know when the survey was done that underlay that permit? Uh, I don't know exactly. I have to believe it was shortly before the LOI was issued. The LOI and the permit were issued at the same time. One of the things we're going to introduce is some photographs of how many, many years ago, I think going back to 2004, this was more lawn, it was more maintained, it has not been maintained, and has really reverted to wild. Um, I'm not testifying, I'm just underlaying, you know, the question I'm going to ask you. Um, on a wetland that has changed in nature, that was maintained lawn and 
has not been for many, many years. Um, is there, are you capable to testify as to the chance that a sentinel species for a higher value wetland may have taken root there in that time? Um, Nine years. I, I'm, I really can't comment on that, but if it is an isolated wetlands, it still is an isolated wetlands, regardless of the value. Do you, do you yourself have personal knowledge as to what made it, um, what made them consider it isolated, given that it is so close to the swale that's part of the Mountain Lakes drainage? Well, when you say so close, it's separated by about 150 feet. Um, so that, is, that does not constitute a connection. Right, and you drew 150 feet over towards, as I'm looking at it, where's the left-hand side. Right, could you the describe, swell. yeah, could you describe that feature? Are you familiar with that feature? I can have my clients testify if, um, if you don't. It's, it's a fairly yeah. wide, flat swell. I haven't really walked downstream very far, but I've, I've just seen the headwater. Do you, do you know the history of that swell? Uh, I don't, but I do know that it takes water from 206 uh, that comes down the property line in the pipe. Are you familiar with other streams that flow into that swale? Other streams? Uh, are you familiar? You may not be familiar. No, no. I'm not. Are you familiar with where that swale, where the water in that swale ends up? Um, I believe it ends up in Stony Brook. I know it goes down and crosses under the next road down in a culvert. Beyond that, I can't really tell you the exact path it takes. Okay. Um, have, have you or Chris, has anybody else done any light or noise studies for this proposal? No. Um, have you or anyone else done any solid waste generating studies for this proposal? Uh, no, but it would be similar to any it would be similar to each unit it would be similar to a three bedroom single family house so so standard single family house right um do you know it, it at one point in the, in the application it referred to four bedroom houses um and it looked to me as if maybe and i don't know because i don't know the, the entire history that at some point those garages which are now single story but attached to the house might have been contemplated to have a bedroom over them do you know anything about that i do not can you a test to how the garages are going to be built. Could they be expanded on uh, top? We have our architect here, so he could okay. answer that. So I'll ask him about that. Um, do you do you know how many bathrooms each unit has? I do not. Again, the architect. Okay, could I'll probably ask the architect that. about that. Um, that's all I have now. I do want to say, given given the usual nature of representing neighbors that just got the letters a couple of days ago. Um, it's possible we may need to bring in an expert. Um, I had actually been calling planners and engineers that I knew starting on Monday, but nobody was able to be here tonight. We might possibly, depending on where the board is going with this, need to have another night um, in order for us to present some testimony. I don't know for sure that that's the case, but it seems like they've got a battery of experts here. I did have to warn my clients about that. Okay, thanks. I generally can only come up with one or two questions per witness, so. Um, Mr. Reed, you're here tonight. You are an attorney, and you're representing yourself. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, I live at 26 Westcott Road up at the head of Wilson. Uh, just two questions, Jeff. The first one was you said that uh, single-family dwellings might generate even more uh, runoff because of pools and uh, larger patios. Uh, right. With the, the units that are proposed, the... The yard areas are going to be common areas, so they would not be allowed to have pools or patios. So there will be no pools or additional patios. That's my behind. understanding, yes. uh, I just wanted to get that clear. And could you tell me which uh, portions of these structures are not subject to the FAR regulations? Is it heating living area? Because I have 20% FAR here <coughs> and 25,000 square foot lots and 5,275 foot homes. I just want to know if some of the homes, some of the areas are not um, subject to the there, FAR. There are some credits uh, for the garage and the, I believe the porches, um, but they do meet the 20% FAR. All right, so is that, is that a heated living area standard, do you know? I should know that, but I just became aware uh, of it recently. You know, I would have to reread your notes. It includes pretty much everything, I think. All right, so. Um, so 20% is not 20%, it's a little bit more than? Well, the 20% the is of whatever is defined as the living area. And as I say, there is a credit 
that's given toward a garage and also a credit given toward the porch. Okay, so does that mean that the garage cannot be heated or? I don't, there was no restriction as far as whether or not it can be heated that I'm aware of. All right, anyway, I just wasn't clear how we got to 5275. Thank you. I just have um, something to um, confirm that that garage credit has disappeared. You are correct. However, they applied before uh, that ordinance took effect. So they're still under the previous ordinance where they get one exception of 280 square foot per lot, not mm -hmm. per unit for the garage, and 100 square feet per covered porch. I see. So, but okay. that's a good Thank point. You. You're correct. Um, Jeff, in terms of uh, a redirect, just a couple of real quick questions. Um, question of maintenance over the the driveway uh, that will be done by the homeowners association yes um, we meet the standard for impervious is that correct yes we meet the standard for far is that correct yes um, we will meet the standards for noise whether it's local or I, I, we will have to yes yeah we're required to we're required. it's a state standard we're required if we didn't we would have sound attenuation um, lighting, does that comply? Uh, yes. Okay. That's it. Oh, uh, my next witness is... Our engineer, which is making... Jeff, while you're there, one of the concerns when we met with, uh, with Joe Scoopian was if the impervious uh, pavement wasn't maintained and did fail, you know, what would happen and, and how could we address that? And Jeff, I don't, you want to describe what we did with the additional inlets? and right. the outlet to the detention basin should, by chance, the impervious pavement fail. Right. If, if the impervious pavement does fail, there will be inlets along the driveway that will uh, bring the water to the outlet structure, just as though it had gone down into the stone. So, so even if the pavement were plugged, it would still function in the same manner. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Um, our next witness is Robert Fania. Robert. Sir, could you spell your last name? Yes. F-A-N-I-A. -A. Robert, can you tell us a little about oh, your oh, education? Oh, 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 I'll swear in. It's okay. Do you swear from your testimony this evening will be truthful? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Jumping ahead. Can you uh, tell us a little bit, bit about your education and qualifications? I'm a licensed architect in uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, I have an inactive license in Connecticut also. Um, master's degree in architecture from Carnegie Mellon University. I'd like to present him as an architect. Thank you. Um, can you... Um, Take us through some of the elevations and floor plans. Yes, I just want to get a few boards here and I'll be right with you. We need to mark these as okay. A six. So A seven, A eight. Well, no, no. We'll start with A six. <laughs> and A six is a floor plan. Can you describe it? Yes. Um, drawing A six is. Uh, let me just step back for a second. This was the original submission. Uh, you can see a transformation in these plans as we went through SPRAB, um, collected their comments, and um, made some changes which we think uh, made this um, a better layout. Um, this is your first floor plan on the right here. 
what you're seeing here is basically a living space, and this is one unit with a garage, and this is one unit with a garage here. There's two decks at the rear of the structure. So essentially, this is that 5,000 square foot footprint that we've been talking about. This you right here. The deck, or you've excluded the deck? In excluded. That footprint statement. Excluded. 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 Yes. The deck. The 2500 number that Chris has mentioned, therefore, is one of these units, which is basically this footprint. 2500 includes the garage. The living area is about 2100. You have about 400 square feet here in a 20 by 20 structure. Um, again, uh, when you, you have your entry points here uh, on this original design were here and here, right next door to one another. Um, not a whole lot of separation, and um, something that we talked to Sprab about, we made some changes to. Essentially, though, the, the, the layout of the interior has not significantly changed other than the entry points that I just pointed out. Um, A7 here is the elevation that was generated, the street front elevation, okay, that was generated uh, for one of these units. You can see that this is one unit, this is another unit, and essentially the elevation was flipped over, but it's the same thing. There's a material change going on here from a stone to a siding material. Um, and you'll see the garages here, which are a lower volume and a lower mass um, alongside of each of the living units. So the discussion we had with Sprab was that we wanted to introduce, they thought that it would be um, a better presentation on the property if these units were designed to give the impression of being a single family residence. Uh, they thought that this was uh, quickly identified as two different units, uh, a front door here and a front door here. And um, they said, is there some way that we can uh, make modifications to this and again give the impression of a single family although it is two units so that is not what you're going to do you're going to show us what you intend to do now it's interesting to have history but it seems almost irrelevant I think we have to start from the point because I think that's what the board was given so we have yeah. to talk about yeah. the evolution Let's know what's going on. Correct. Huh? Well, they're showing us things that they're not going to do. What they thought they might do, but they're not anymore. As I understand their, their testimony. And that's fascinating, but not useful. This will be A9 and A10. A8. A8 and A9. Yeah. We met with Sprab our first session, and um, we discussed some of those points that I just ended the previous um, design with and we made some modifications to the design uh, again if you look at the floor plan you're going to see it's pretty similar to the to the uh, previous plan that I showed however we redid the front elevation um, and we produced this elevation the idea here was again to try to give the impression of a single family home um, and not so much of the repetitive nature of the first design that I showed to you. When you look at this design, you can really identify a front door. For the next unit, though, the unit, the front door is set back. It's under a porch, and it's not right up against and, and next to the uh, unit that it is adjoining. 
You have the garages on each side. That's similar as before. You also, we introduce material changes on the exterior elevation. We have a stone base. We have a stucco wall section above that. And then we have siding above that. I marked this A10. So when you put this all together, um, we're looking at the three duplex units. This would be, again, looking from the street and looking at the front elevations of these units. Um, you'll see that there's a change in uh, entry points. There's uh, changes in materials. There's changes in colors. Um, and we're, again, trying to make the impression of a single family home. But again, there are two duplexes in each one of these. Uh, the middle one here would be an all brick exterior. And then we have combinations of siding, stucco, and stone um, on the one on the left. And we have siding on the one on the right here. Um, these separations are to scale in terms of the amount of distance between the units and between the garages that you see here in this drawing. I have one more set here of drawings that I want to put up. I marked this one A11. Um, we had our second meeting with Sprad, reviewing these previous plans that I just showed you. Uh, and some comments came out about um, the amount of roof that was visible with some of these units here in terms of uh, the mass of the roof running all the way out to the edge and a gable at the end. Not only that, when you looked at it from the side elevation, you had a fairly splayed out long gable um, that was not real attractive. And there were suggestions of uh, reshaping that roof. So we came and we looked at that and we developed some additional elevations here. I have copies of these. You don't have these. Um, should we pass those out or? We could, yeah. We'll mark the, uh, well, what do we mark that exhibit as? A11. A11, so A12 would be a uh, package of updated exhibits based on comments received from SPRAD. This is updated elevations then. Is that yeah. correct? Okay. And floor plans. Thank you. Reshaping the, uh, the roof lines per SPRAB comment, you'll see that in the previous uh, elevations, the, the long gable on the side uh, was taken out. We went to either a gable that was running front to back, um, or we had a hip roof that was introduced to try to, in an effort to reduce the, the, the scale of the roof and the amount of surface um, with this. 
Um, we also introduced shutters on certain windows. You will see material changes on these plans. Um, this one, for instance, is the SD8 drawing, which is a brick uh, exterior. And you'll see how the roof uh, lines are similar, yet you have different gables in terms of the location on the front elevation and different roof de details that cut through the gable end of the elevation. Again, the attempt here is to try to bring some diversity to the unit, um, but uh, staying with the same architectural vocabulary for the different materials and the details on the structures. So he's available for any questions. So I have a question. As, as an architect, did you agree with Scrab's recommendations regarding make it look like a single family home? Um, yes, I did agree with that. I think that when you consider the big issue here in terms of the planning issues that we've been talking about, um, I think the, the presentation of a structure on this property, given the area that it's in, um, I think it helps if it's um, not looking as all these multiple units that are all the same. I think to give the impression of one house and yet it's really two units is effective and it makes more of a transition uh, between single family and some of the multifamily that are in the area. Then my thinking is if we want it to look like a single family home, how do we say a single family home is not appropriate for the area? Well, I think the key, uh, the key way to answer that is that um, this area is an area of transition. And as the other testimony has been given by the uh, other individuals here, uh, there are single family homes nearby. There are multifamily units nearby as well. Uh, so this is an area where you have everything coming together. So a design challenge would be to, as Sprab had indicated, we understand the two, plex, the two units, the duplex units, but we also understand the area that it's in. Is there some way to make both of these work? Oh. I didn't read that in the scrap report. They didn't bless or not bless duplexes. They were silent on that. So I'm not sure that that's correct. Well, do any other members of the board have questions? Do you wish to? Please. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Fannin, for the record, and Stud Home again. Um, you know, I, I saw it on one of the plans, but I just want to ask you to make sure it's accurate. Can you tell me how high to the ridge line the proposed buildings are? Yeah, it's about 29 feet, 3 inches. To, to the ridge line. Can, yeah. can you tell me what the construction is of those roofs? Is it, is it a truss roof? Um, it would either be a truss roof or stick framed. Stick, have, if, it were, if it were stick frame, would it be accessible as an attic? Yes. And if it's truss frame, it's also accessible. It, it, but but less, less room inside it. Less usable, perhaps. Um, well, perhaps. So, so there, could be, there could be as much usable room inside it if it were a truss. Oh, there's space there. That sure. Oh, okay, sure. that's interesting. And is there how much how much standing headroom would there be in, in the center? I understand they're sloped. Um, I haven't worked out the sectional details of these structures. Might be something on the order of seven or eight feet. Okay. Um, so, would there be any structural reason why that space could not be, as so many houses in town have been, turned into a third floor? If it's a truss frame structure, um, yes, you don't violate the makeup of the truss, okay? You have diagonal bracing in it. It would, 
it's accessible space, but it's not usable space. But if it's not a truss structure. If it's stick framed, then depending on the size of the members that you use for the ceiling joist, which become floor joist, right. um, it's possible that you could do something with that. How about over the garage? Will the garages support an extra story over them if one of the homeowners wanted to do that? Only if the framing, again, is designed to carry those loads. So right now, in your previous question that came up, there's been no consideration of having living space above these. Um, and can you ask, was, was I wrong to see a reference to a four bedroom earlier? I mean, put it this yeah. way, I know I wasn't wrong, but was it a mistake? Was it a misconception that someone had? I, I heard you say that, and to my knowledge, that's a mistake, because these have always been, I, again, I started with the initial plans, always been three bedroom units. And, and can you tell me why that, why that is, why three bedrooms? Uh, when you look at the plan and the square footage, we have about a thousand, I'm going to round this off, about 1,050 square feet per floor. Um, we could only get in, I, I don't want to bring up the second floor plan again, but it only laid out for three uh, bedrooms, reasonable bedrooms. And, and was the, the floor area constraint the, the FAR that we've heard discussed? Yes. Okay. So would it be correct to say that, that you are maximizing the number of bedrooms within the applicable FAR? Yes. Um, and I have, it's probably, it's pretty much the same question that Mr. Floyd just asked, just from the opposite way. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us why it's not appropriate for single family, but it is appropriate for these very large, attractive family units of housing? What, what's the difference? What makes it inappropriate for single family, but appropriate for these? That's really going to be for our planner to go through. And, and I'm happy. I mean, it's just you started. You started in answering. If, if the planner will discuss it, if you can't well, discuss it, that's fine. I can. I, I can. Answer it, but I'll, it's really I'll offer an architectural response to okay. that. I think with the 5,000 square feet, you could generate a plan for a single-family home, obviously without any problem, or you could test it and see if a duplex unit would work within that square footage. And I think when you look at the plans and the sizes of the rooms and so forth, and you limit it to three bedrooms, it works for that too. I, and I apologize, I just didn't understand the question. I, I'd heard that because it's across the street from a gas station and a bank, um, that despite being in the R5 zone where everything else is single family, oh, and let me ask you, are you familiar with the lots immediately to the north and immediately, immediately to the south of this property? Um, vaguely. Okay, probably more than vaguely all of us are. It's a single family street. Okay. Um, and so if, if it's, can, can, we were talking about why is it not? Now I want to know, if it's not appropriate for single family, why is it appropriate for a two family? Well, I think what, I'm, what I tried to say before is that you have a mix of... I, first of all, this is really a planning question, so I, I would, if, if, I mean, this is not an architectural question. <laughs> right, I, no, I, I was actually the safer for the planner, but I so just... So why don't we wait, wait for the planner? That's fine. Mr. Fania, if you prefer not to answer it, then... Um, well, I, I think Chris is uh, right. There's a lot of okay. planning issues okay. wrapped around that. Uh, the comment that I just made before, though, was, again, as an architect responding to perhaps planning issues, and I am not a professional planner. Um, I see this area as a, as a transition space. I see it as an area where there's a lot of things coming together, whether they're single family, whether they're multi-dwelling units, whether they're commercial directly across the street. And it seemed to make sense to me that the single family would have less attractiveness here on this property than a duplex unit would be based on those other factors. Can, can you say why? I, I, it seems you have a very strong feeling, and I'd love to well, explore I, I why. Think, I think you get into some planning issues on that. And but, but you as an architect agree with those planning issues. Well, mm -hmm. but, I, but I don't have the expertise to really talk about to those. Or to articulate it. Right. Okay, then, then I'll leave that question for the planner. I think it really may be the heart of what's going on here. Why is it not okay for single family? And we all know the answer to this. But someone needs to be able to spit it out. We need an expert witness who can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Yep. Archie. Mr. Reed, do you have any cross exam? Okay. <coughs> okay, moving along. I'd like to introduce our planner, David Carpack. Carpack. Excuse me, 
Sir, do you swear to affirm your testimony this evening will be truthful? I do. Thank you. David, before you get into the testimony, can you give us a little bit about your qualifications in, in education? Yes, I have an undergraduate degree in landscape architecture from Rutgers University. I also have a master's degree in city and regional planning, also from Rutgers University. I'm a licensed professional planner in the state of New Jersey, and I have been for over 20 years. I previously qualified and testified as an expert planning witness before planning boards and boards of adjustment throughout the state. I've also qualified as an expert planning witness in superior court and federal court. Present him as an expert in planning. Okay, I think if you could just take us through the project and particularly why we feel um, this suit, this particular project is in, uh, property rather, is impractical for a single family and why we think that a duplex is a fantastic idea. Certainly. To address okay. positive and negative. Criteria. Oh, he'll go through all that, yes. That's coming later. Yeah, he'll, 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 yeah, going to do, he'll, it. he'll do it. Good. Um, I have one exhibit that I'd like to introduce. I'll mark one into evidence and we'll pass the others around. You have to speak clearly because it's hard for us to hear you. Certainly. We don't get you on the record. All right, so this will be Exhibit A13. I'll just wait for A13 to get passed around before we talk about it. I'll just describe it as such. It's an exhibit consisting of three sheets. The first sheet uh, is a, an aerial uh, photograph of the site and the surrounding area. The site itself is outlined in yellow and it does describe some of the surrounding land uses, including that commercial district uh, directly opposite uh, 206, which includes the gas station and the bank, and of course uh, the community park in the lower right-hand corner, otherwise uh, mostly single-family uh, residential uses in the area. Without going through each and every photo... Wait, wait, wait. Mr. Carr, question for you. Did you prepare these? No, these were prepared by John McDonough, who's an associate of mine. Okay, so it's under your supervision in your office. Uh, actually, it was done in his office, but I have reviewed it with Mr. McDonough, and I believe his work to be accurate and correct. All right. Um, the second sheet are just various views of the subject property panning from um, left to right. And then finally, the last sheet, which is sheet three, shows some of the uh, immediate surrounding land uses. Uh, again, the bank in the upper left-hand corner, the gas station and repair garage in the upper right photograph, and on the bottom photographs you see a, a view of Route 206 looking in either direction from this site. So what does this exhibit tell us? Well, it's, it's a co-mingled development pattern. It's not a homogeneous neighborhood by any stretch of the imagination. Um, in terms of density and mass of some of the structures in the area, again, it's, it's uh, very diverse. Um, you have another multifamily development in close proximity to the site at 251 uh, Baird. Um, there are smaller homes on small lots uh, on the opposite side of the street, and I'm talking about that area that's surrounded between Birch Lane and Lehigh Court. Uh, that's within the R9 zone. Those lots, I believe, are required to be 6,500 square feet. In fact, some of them are smaller than 6,500 square feet. And there are multifamily or duplex developments in that same neighborhood. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, townhomes or duplexes are not uncommon in this area. They do exist. Now, I'm not saying that just because they exist in this neighborhood that this applicant is entitled to a variance. But what I am saying is if the board were to act favorably on this application, that a duplex development would not be incongruous with this neighborhood. They do exist today. It's not a solid single family residential neighborhood. And then of course, um, further off this sheet, which you can't see, but if you were to travel a short distance off this sheet, there is that MX zone, which is a mixed use zone and from what I understand, there uh, uh, are approvals and there is construction taking place on that very site uh, for multifamily development uh, as well. So the characteristics of this particular site is that it has frontage 
on an arterial roadway. And it is a roadway that does carry a fair amount of truck traffic. Uh, it's, it's actually a, uh, there, are, there is regional truck traffic in this area. It is directly opposite that gas station with the repair garage. And quite frankly, I don't think it's entirely appropriate for single family development, not solely because of its uh, location directly across from these commercial uses, but certainly that's a big part of it. The traffic and its location across the street from a gas station with a repair garage. Um, if somebody were interested in, in, in developing this property, if you had the choice to build an estate home in this neighborhood on a half acre lot, I don't think this is the first location you would choose. In fact, if there was a vacant lot available uh, in that neighborhood to the north, certainly that would be in a more appropriate location. Um, people have a lot of choices today when it comes to new housing. Very unlikely somebody is going to spend money on this particular piece of property for the purpose of building a new home, a new possibly 5,000 square foot home with five bedrooms directly across the street from a gas station with a repair garage on a busy roadway. It's just not likely. So the current zoning has failed to manifest itself, at least as it relates to this particular property. It remains vacant, save that single uh, home that exists on the lot today, which is in a state of disrepair. It's not being maintained on a regular basis. It's certainly not being maintained as well as some of the other neighborhoods and uh, the other homes in the neighborhood. It doesn't compare. The current zoning, as I said, um, despite Princeton's attractiveness as a high, highly desirable place to live, the zoning hasn't manifested itself on this lot. Now the proposal, I think you heard the architect describe in great detail what's being proposed, so I won't get into it. Um, but in terms of some of the important site features, um, there is going to be quite an enhancement on this lot. Uh, landscape architecture, you're going to have uh, an upgraded streetscape with new sidewalk, decorative wall lights, street trees, and some of the other improvements we spoke of, which are going to have an immediate effect on beautifying this site. And I think correcting what I would characterize as an unattractive void in the streetscape. Now, this is an R5 zone. Um, permitted uses include single family homes on half acre lots. So that would lead, uh, yield a development density of two dwelling units per acre. Uh, townhomes and duplexes are not contemplated in this zone. They're not permitted. Uh, the proposal is for six dwelling units on 73,660 square feet of land. That's 1.69 acres. So that would yield a development density of 3.55 dwelling units per acre. Now in terms of the positive criteria, I think uh, redevelopment of this site with duplexes advances um, of the planning goal of providing a variety of housing stock and is more in keeping with the mixed use nature of this area. The site is particularly well suited for this use by virtue of its, its context. It's directly opposite. I'm going to approach the board now, excuse me, and show you. If you look at the S2 zone, it, it coincides exactly with this zone across the street. It's almost like a mirror image. All of the frontage along this lot coincides with the frontage in front of the S2 zone. So that does it make it somewhat unique as compared to these other properties in the zone, directly opposite the S2 zone. Um, townhouse dwellers, and I think what I'm doing now is I'm going to get into a further explanation of why I feel this is more appropriate for duplexes and not single family homes. Um, for one thing, townhouse dwellers have a, less of an expectation of privacy, okay? And when you subscribe to townhouse development, you've subscribed to a certain type of lifestyle. And that lifestyle, in fact, includes greater density, less privacy, and lower housing costs. The people that buy these units are not going to pay what somebody would pay for a single family home. So what you're doing is it's almost like a, it's an economic trade-off. 
I'm paying less money for this unit with the understanding I'm living across the street from a commercial zone, which includes a bank and a filling station with a repair garage, with that canopy above the gas station being lit up at night, and truck traffic in front of my house, and I'm willing to pay the cost for that as a duplex. As a single family homeowner, I'm probably not going to be able to put up with uh, all those things that are happening in this neighborhood. I'm going to seek out a more appropriate lot for a single family home. It's not going to happen here. <clears throat> and this site, I think, significantly accommodates this type of use without generating any bulk variances. Okay? The, the only variance that's being sought is the use variance. There's no further encroachments onto the front yard setback, the side yard setbacks. There's no um, other building or impervious um, violations. In fact, the home that exists on the site today violates the front yard setback and the side yard setback. So in a way, we're actually bringing this lot more in conformity to the zone with respect to setbacks. <laughs> I believe this project does advance several important purposes of the municipal land use law. One is promotion of the public good, and that's accomplished with new housing, enhancing the diversity of residential options available in Princeton. And that comes directly from your master plan. If I can find the passage, I'll read it to you. Uh, but that's exactly what the master plan says. The 90, 1996 land use plan endeavors to maintain and enhance the diversity of residential options available in Princeton. To meet the needs of a broad spectrum of residents and different, of different ages and income groups, it provides for a variety of housing areas, sizes, and types. So certainly, I think that purpose of the master plan is advanced. Uh, in a related way, purpose G of the municipal land use law is to provide for a variety of uses according to need. And this housing type, this duplex, responds to housing demand. The multifamily market remains the strongest residential sector in New Jersey and nationwide. So this project will provide new, diverse housing stock, keeping with the mixed character of the area, and providing new housing stock is the goal of virtually every community, including this community. Purpose H in the municipal land use law is the promotion of the free flow of traffic. And I think that's accomplished because here you're limiting access to one curb cut, one driveway serving these um, three lots and six units. If this were developed as a single family development, you'd have three curb cuts, more points of conflict, and uh, I think this particular design is safer as far as accessing uh, 206, which is a busy road. Purpose I, promotion of a desirable visual environment, and that's accomplished by replacing an old building, again, not being maintained on a regular basis, in disrepair, with new, beautiful buildings, with modern architectural treatments, new landscaping, all of this, which I believe is more harmonious with the area. The architect described this duplex as being reminiscent of a single family home. Uh, and I would agree with that assessment. From the street, it will have that appeal as looking like a single family home. And the massing would be similar. Um, you have 2,500 square foot buildings, two of them on one lot. And quite honestly, what could be accomplished on this lot in a single family uh, uh, scenario would be a 5,000 square foot home. So the massing is the same. In terms of the negative criteria, I believe the relief can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and without substantially impairing the intent and purpose of the zone plan. Um, this relief will not cause any substantial visual or physical Im impacts. Uh, the overall form of the project will, be, uh, com will comply with the ordinance. And we talked about the setbacks. The relief will not impede the privacy, use, or enjoyment of the neighbors. It has a very nice buffering, a nicely defined edge to the development compared to what could occur with a single family home. So what am I speaking of precisely? Well, in the rear of this property, you're going to have that uh, detention basin, which I would characterize as a passive use. What would likely have happened if this were a single family home is you could possibly have a pool with a deck, a lot more activity in the backyard, what I would characterize as active 
active uses and possibly have accessory structures that would be placed you know, near or at that rear property line. So here, again, you have the advantage of ha maintaining that buffer or that very uh, passive use, the detention pond, which uh, I think really helps the property owners uh, to the south and the southwest. Uh, the relief will not impair the intent of the zone plan. Uh, as I said, this application does remove some non-conforming bulk conditions. Um, and it does move this application more into conformance with the ordinance as it relates to uh, those bulk standards. This relief does relate to a specific piece of property with distinct influences that affect its viability for utility as single family development. So this relief is not tantamount to a rezone. And I spoke about some of the unique features of the site, including its location directly across the street from the S2 zone in its entirety. Um, in terms of public health, the intensity of use will not cause any substantial detrimental health effect. Uh, it will not be a substantial or a significant generator of refuse, air pollution, or water pollution. Um, I would expect it would generate all the same influences as single family homes. In terms of public safety, the intensity of use will not cause any substantial detriment uh, to safety concerns. The proposed development does not have any serious police or security issues, fire, rescue issues, or any safety flaws. I believe the circulation pattern is well planned. In terms of public welfare, the intensity of use will not cause any substantial detrimental nuisances. Uh, this use will not result in any significant amount of noise, vibration, odors, glare, or any other objectionable influences. Um, when viewed in context with the ambient conditions in the neighborhood. In terms of public service, the intensity of use will not overburden public water, sewer, or utility systems. And in terms of neighbor neighborhood impacts, it will not um, interfere with the privacy use or enjoyment of neighbor neighborhood properties. It will not impact the character of the area and there will be no interference with the penetration of light or air onto adjoining properties because it does meet the building height requirements and all the setback requirements. It doesn't jeopardize any open space. So I'll just conclude by saying this application is consistent with good planning by replacing an older residential building with new buildings, modern architectural treatments, correcting an unattractive void, and integrating this site finally with its surroundings. I think the board should feel very comfortable in granting this devariance application. <coughs> yes. I just wanted to make a comment about single family driveways versus the three two units that are there. This is a major subdivision. It's three lots. So a site plan is required. So the these lots couldn't be developed independently. They'd have to come in for a site plan subdivision review. If it was single families, it would be at the planning board. But I myself reviewing the application would not advocate three single driveways. And I don't know if Jack, the engineer, would, would go that direction. You'd also have to get DEP approval. So if, if they were single families, they'd still be going through this process. It would be a, just a different board of jurisdiction. So. I guess I look at it and, and your first Steve. exhibit, your Steve. aerial photograph. Uh, the, uh, the first exhibit, the aerial photograph, um, it's clearly a, resident, a single family residential area. Um, it's, it's surrounded behind it a single family, adjacent to it a single family. Um, and I don't believe that, that uh, the character of the neighborhood would be enhanced by a multifamily unit. I mean, the, the units themselves, in, in talking about character, are clearly multifamily units. There are four garages. There are going to be six garages facing the street. It's clearly not a single family house um, in a single family area. I mean, the nature of Princeton now is, again, people are developing many, many different types of lots. And, and uh, even though, yes, it is across from a gas station, it's across from the bank, and, and uh, 
but it's still a single family area. And, and I don't know if, I don't know what compelling reason you would have if you're looking at a, a volume of structure which is compatible. Your, your, your discussion is the duplex and the single family would be relatively the same. Two duplexes or one single family. Um, so what reason is there to change the nature of the use and go with a, a, uh, a duplex as opposed to one single family on each lot? What's well, the reason? I, I, I think I characterize this particular site as being somewhat unique because it has certain uh, problems associated with it, including its proximity to the gas station with the repair ba uh, base and the heavy truck traffic on Route 206. There's also bus traffic on Route 206. And I don't know that single family dwellers would be tolerant of all those conditions and build an estate home, you know, a five bedroom home at this particular location. That was my I, I, I guess it, it's, still, it's still a residential development. And, and whether it's uh, somebody building a 5,000 square foot house or you know, two families living in, in, in two 2,500 square foot attached units, it's still a residential development. But I, 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 agree, I agree, but my testimony was that, again, uh, people that live in townhomes or duplexes subscribe to a different lifestyle. And part of the trade-off, okay, is the lower price of the townhouse. You're not right. going to pay for a townhouse. Well, you're going to pay for a single-family home. That's just the way. That's the way of the world. Mm -hmm. So I think it might attract buyers that are looking to save a few bucks and deal with some of the problems in this neighborhood because they're doing it at a lower price. But it's still changing the character of the neighborhood. I mean, it's a single-family neighborhood. Let me. Let, let me. Um, Let me review with you a, a resolution that was adopted some time ago. It was by um, the Board of Adjustment um, for a similar development at 251 Baird, a short distance from this site. That development was for it's 13 dwelling units. Right 13 dwelling units. Um, 12 of them were multifamily. One was a single family home that was proposed to be renovated and kept at that location. Um, that was on a two and a half acre site. So the development density there was 5.2 dwelling where, units where is, per acre. Where is, where is 251 Baird? Right there. And if you're looking at this map here, it's the next property around the turn on this side. This is the R6 zone, is that correct? Right? No, yeah, it's the R5. R5? Yes. R5 zone. I'm gonna review with uh, you um, some of the findings of the board. You're not allowed to ask questions right now. I'll just review this with the. Oh, Mr. Kerlock, I don't want to interrupt your testimony, but just to clarify for the board, the resolution you're referring to is from 1981. Is that correct? correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. Um, personal inspection of the subject property made by board members has convinced them that the surrounding streets, the proximity to non residential uses, such as the community park, the extremely heavy truck. Uh, excuse me, the extremely heavy traffic volume on Route 206, present construction costs, et cetera, combined to make it impractical to use the property for the purpose permitted under the present ordinance. What year so was that? I'm, I'm echoing a lot of the same sentiments uh, that the board did in 1981, because this site is a very short distance from 251 uh, Baird. And, and again, I think it, the neighborhood exhi exhibits uh, many of the same uh, characteristics. I forget. W when did we pass our zoning ordinance? I'm sorry? Well, the master zone plan. Do you recall what date that was? The master plan that you referred to? Oh, the destroyed? master plan, I, that was uh, 1996, but it was uh, actually amended several times after 96. Okay. So if I understand correctly, you appropriately refer to the master plan and you explain that it's important for us, and, and, and I get it. I mean, people come before us, and some people believe that zoning laws inflate housing costs. They believe that it limits housing supply. They believe that it can exacerbate segregation. 
I understand that. I understand some people believe that. And I think our zoning plan was meant to address those issues. That plan was done in 1996, if I understand you correctly? And it's been modified a couple of times, correct? Yes. yes. So at the time that that zoning plan was done, wasn't the R5 zone either recognized or put in place in that plan? And at that same plan that you are referring to, didn't it also specifically say that only single family residences would be allowed in this zone? No, I don't think the plan says that. The plan really doesn't refer to those areas by zone. It re refers to them by land use categories. In other words, it will call it a low density land use category, moderate, high, and, and, and uh, high density land use category. And those categories then uh, are attached to the zones or refer to those particular zones. Um, so you can view it in that context, yes. I mean, look, I, I, I think you've done an excellent presentation. I really think you've done an excellent job. Uh, I, I like how you talked about the location being unique. I like how you talk about that it, it promotes the purposes of zoning and the zoning plan. I'm not convinced how duplexes are particularly suited to this site and why we should, on the one hand, take the recommendations of a zoning plan um, on the one hand, on the other hand, completely ignore the fact that it's saying that this area is zoned only for single family residences. And that's what you're asking us to do. <clears throat> well, I think what happens is that not, you know, this, this particular lot was maybe not at the forefront when the master plan was being developed, okay? A lot of times master plans deal with like hot button issues, okay? The things that are on the front burner, things that need to be addressed immediately. Um, they don't address each and every vacant parcel in town. So it may have been something that just, you know, escaped a very specific recommendation uh, for this site. And that's why we're here today. We're here today because I'm bringing attention to the fact that that R5 zone may not be appropriate, appropriate for this particular property. It escaped the master plan, and here we're talking about it tonight. You um, made an indication statement basically indicating that maybe this site is less marketable and that's why it wasn't developed. Do you know the previous owners? No, I do not. The long time owners? No. Do you know maybe they just didn't choose to develop it because they were quiet, modest people? The long time previous owner? And that's, that's one thing. Um, so I, I think to make that linkage that it hasn't been developed because maybe the long-time owners just didn't want to develop it. Now, um, but if you, if you don't... You, I, I, I have no first-hand knowledge about, uh, you know, the history of this site other than to tell you that the current owner has uh, owned the property for nine years. Now, you also mentioned the site being in disrepair. Well, if your client's been owning it, how to get in disrepair? And you're, you're making that part of your argument. That's why I'm well, jumping I'm, on I'm not saying because it's in disrepair he's entitled to a variance. I'm just saying... Well, you made it as part of your, your presentation on why we should give it a variance, not the only one. When you have vacant property, it's not going to be maintained to the same degree as property that's occupied. So I guess my, my assertion is that it, it, once this property or if this property is developed at some point in the future, it's going to be maintained regularly and it will be more in keeping with the well-maintained homes in this neighborhood. And that's why I think it will integrate better with those homes. Okay. Better. I think a lot of your presentation has focused on 206 and the... Um, possibility, the opportunity of housing facing areas on 206 that are not particularly um, uh, beautiful. I think what is really significant here, and Mr. Cohen said this earlier, is the um, neighborhood, as um, Ms. Stoutholm had said, behind this, these lots. Um, it's very surprising if you come off 206 and go directly behind this property, you come to literally what I would call an oasis. You have single, small, single-family homes that are very well maintained. It's unusually quiet, 
and it's you know a few hundred feet from 206 to me this is the neighborhood that you have to really consider and the one that your development i think would interfere interrupt um there's uh an impact of what you're describing that to me does not fit with the neighborhood that's behind it <coughs> and, and also this perpendicular to that particular street um, and I would I would suggest that possibly you would want to consider even a, a, a smaller um, design. I realize what you've said is that you've uh, I downsized is the wrong word, but you've you've limited it. To, you've you've come to us with a plan that is smaller than the original plan, but as far as I can see, it's still very large for the um, area that you're talking about. I'm, I'm sorry. I, was there a question in there? Was that a statement? If, I, if it was a question, well, I apologize. It was a statement, but okay. is, there, is there any way that you can design this to be smaller, or does it simply interfere with the, I, I, I don't want to use the word profitability, but the, um, the development of the site? Well, we have a particular case in front of us to consider. They, in principle, have made the decision that this is what they want to do, and it's the most suitable thing, in their opinion, okay. for this site. I don't think we can ask them to redesign it in real time. Okay. Um, just, I, I'm not trying to interfere. I think the statement you've made is a valid one, but I don't think that a, a discourse about whether you could drop the roof three feet or whatever will be, will be helpful at this point. Okay. Thank you. More fundamental comments. Did you? Uh, just for the benefit of the board, um, since Mr. Curlix referred to this 1981 uh, resolution with respect to 251 Baird, um, in fact, that application was denied. It was then appealed to the governing body. The governing body approved it. It then apparently uh, was challenged in Superior Court. And ultimately, looks as if a uh, settlement was reached, which uh, reduced the number of the dwelling units. Uh, so it's just a matter of having a more complete history of what, what happened. And uh, I guess 30, uh, over 30 years ago uh, with 251 Nassau. And it wasn't actually denied by vote, though. It had four and didn't reach the five votes. So there was four, four in favor, three that were against, and then it got appealed to the governing body. Yeah. OK. Um, um, oh. Sorry, do you want to have a go? I, I was going to say something. So yeah. I just, um, I do appreciate the effort to try to not make it look like a development and to consider some of the concerns of the neighbors. And I, you know, looking at it, can see that it, it is, I mean, I think you can categorize it as being unique to a certain extent. And normally I am a fan of more development when it's in proximity to transportation. But I think the hard part is when somebody moves into a residential area and it's zoned to be a single family residential area, they have that expectation. It's very different when you're, you know, if you're living in downtown Princeton and you're expecting it to be very quiet and you don't want a lot of density there, that, that's a different scenario. It's, you know, again, there are some unique natures about this which make the property face busy commercial area, but I think it does back up to what is clearly a residential area. And I think I can understand that maybe someone won't want to come and put a huge um, 5,000 square foot home that faces um, 206, but the house could be centered a different way, possibly. So that it, you know, I mean, it, it's not like, is that the only way that the house you know, in terms of it not being desirable at all, it kind of sounds like, well, here's this vacant lot. It's not being maintained. If we want it to be maintained and taken care of, the best solution is to make it into multi-unit housing because that's what would be, um, that's what would enable it to be saleable. 
but I don't know, I mean, we don't really know that. I mean, maybe someone would want to, you know, you're going to make them into three conforming lots, and maybe someone will want to put up a single residential home. Um, and we wouldn't have to make an exception or give you a variance to use it in a way that it's not, it's not zoned for. Um, you know, I'm just trying to wonder, like, and, and again, I'm not, it's not like I'm against it. As I said, I'm, I'm a fan of more um, dense, you know, having more densely populated areas. I under need, understand the need for mixed housing. I agree the price point would be better. It's nice. To, all, all of that sounds good. The problem for me is that it's in an area that's zoned to be a single family area. And so we have all these families that are living there with that expectation and how do we, you know, what, how do we justify changing that? What's, what's well, the... We, we will hopefully do that. I know? hear the audience. Well, I'm just going to repeat one earlier thought and that was that this development does provide that hard line between um, this property and the property of the South and the Southwest because you have that detention basin. You're not going to have those active uses that you might normally experience in the backyard of a single family home. You're not going to have a pool with a deck. You're not going to have a lot of activity back there, encroachments by sheds and cabanas and other things that's, that sort of creep their way to the sidelines and the rear lines of properties. I think this is going to be a much more passive backyard than what you would have under uh, the current zoning scheme. See, I'd like to, we have a lot of people in the audience who have signed up to speak to this. You want to make another comment? Oh, you want a break? Oh. Can we have a five minute break at this point and when, when we come back after that, I would like to hear from the audience. Uh, about yeah, Chairman Royce, we still need cross-examination, though, by uh, Ms. Studholm and Mr. Reed, if he wishes. Oh, yeah, after the break. You wanted to cross-examine? Is that the tornado? That's Zeus giving an opinion. <laughs> Okay. 
kids. Maybe later. So I'm going to call us back to order, and um, it's my intention to start uh, by inviting members of the public who have identified uh, their desire to speak mm -hmm. to this case to come and do that. Um, and then we have two attorneys, I believe, or an attorney representing. We do. Ch Chairman Rose, I think perhaps um, I, may, I may have misresponded to the, to the question you'd asked me. My understanding was the board would first let the attorneys do cross-examination of uh, Mr. Oh, Kerlick oh, first, I'm then you'd Mr. open it to public sure. comment, then Ms. Studholm can uh, Is there somebody who wishes to cross-examine this witness? Oh, there you are. Yes, okay. Into the microphone as well, so Attempting we have you all on record. Attempting to spare my clients the expense of having to have a planner here. Um, we're obviously, the board knows, and you'll be advised by your attorney, you're allowed to take his testimony for what it's worth. You can, you can um, accept it or not. We don't have to have another planner to say everything that he said. He says it's the moon. We say it's the sun. We're the opposite of him. But I do have a couple of questions for him. Because we are at a slight disadvantage, he's the only planning witness here. Um, and I apologize. My first question is, I'm very sorry. I missed your name. Can you tell me your name? David Carlback. K-A-R-L-E-B-A-C-H. Carlback. I'm pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Okay. So 
you had read to us a little bit from the master plan. I just wanted to ask, are you familiar with the following sections of the master plan? I'm going to read them quickly into the record. It's the only way I have to get them in the record. Just tell me whether you're familiar with them or not. Um, and I'm representing that this is from the master plan of Princeton. New development must be compatible with neighboring uses and must minimize and buffer its impact on adjacent uses. When newer expanding uses impinge on residential areas, extra measures are commonly required to mitigate its impact and maintain the residential quality of life. Are you familiar with that? That sounds familiar. Okay. Um, Existing neighborhoods should be maintained wherever possible by encouraging renovation and reuse of older buildings and developing new uses for those areas that are underutilized. Yes, I remember reading that. Okay. New housing development should be organized and designed to create and sustain attractive and safe neighborhoods. Critical parameters are the relationships buildings have to each other, parking and major roadways and open spaces. Positive organizing features include open spaces, gathering places, shared facilities, and recreation areas. I'm familiar with that? I, I'll, okay. I'll stipulate I read the master plan and you've read the master plan. I'm familiar with all those passages. Are you familiar with goal X in the land use element which is preserve and protect the character of established neighborhoods? That's probably in every master plan. Uh, do you think that because it's in every master plan it doesn't have force? I didn't say that. Do you think it should be ignored? No. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, you'd, you talked about, you had touched on moderate density residential, uh, low density residential. Um, are you familiar with, and I'm looking at page 24 of the most recent version of the master plan, where they define and describe moderate density residential and high density residential? Yes. And moderate density residential, they say one half acre lot to two acre lot size. Moderate density areas make up the bulk of Princeton residential land area. For the most part, these are established neighborhoods whose moderate density has historically been divided into two categories. Medium low density with homes on one and a half to two acre lots, and medium high density with homes on one half to one acre lots. In general, the medium low density areas are characterized by moderate environmental constraints for future development, and the medium high density areas typically have few if any constraints to development. Are you familiar with that moderate density residential? Yes. And can you tell me the R5? Is that a moderate density residential? Well, the moderate density residential land use category would correspond to the uh, R5 zone because it's between one half acre to two acres in lot size. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And the high density residential, and I'm going to read it, just want to make sure you, you say yes, that's in there, I'm familiar with it, and I'll ask my question. High density residential, lot size is less than one half acre. High density housing includes single family dwellings on small lots, two family houses, townhouses, and multifamily housing. For the most part, these areas include established neighborhoods. These areas are characterized by the relative absence of environmental constraints and the availability of utilities and services. Higher density housing and multifamily units should be permitted only in environmentally appropriate locations of limited extent and where amenities such as playgrounds and common community facilities can be made available. <coughs> Are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay. Um, given the 3.55 units per acre resulting density of the proposed development, would that, in your opinion as a planner, render it high density residential? Also the fact that it's two family houses. Well, I think it would uh, definitely correspond to what the master plan is characterizing as high density residential, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, when, when you were testifying, um, <coughs> you were comparing uh, what you called an estate home and what other witnesses talk about three estate homes of 5,000 square feet each. And I understood you to say probably no one would build such a large home, even one of them, let alone three of them, on this lot. Did you, when you were comparing as a planning matter, did you compare to three houses of, say, 2,500 square feet each? I'm, I'm sorry, did I compare them with Much smaller houses. three smaller Three smaller, homes. three normal size houses. No, I did not, no. Okay. Um, I, I, may have, I may have missed it, and I apologize. I'm just trying to take notes quickly. I didn't hear much about the impacts of the use impacts. Did you undertake any analysis of the use impacts of the resulting increased density? 
Well, I, I talked about uh, not overburdening the uh, public utility system, things of that nature. Um, I think we touched upon traffic, uh, but didn't go into a great detail. Um, so, yes, we talked about noise, vibration, odors, glare, things of that nature, police, fire, security. So we did talk about the, the, the characteristics and the use impacts, yes. Do you think that the use impacts, your opinion, of this six-unit large three-bedroom, two-car garage, 3.5 parking space per unit development would be the same as the impacts of three 2,500, let's say, square foot single family houses? Six versus three. Would the impacts be the same? I think they're substantially similar. How about three townhomes? Three townhomes. Would that be similar to six well, when, or to when three you're single talking family about houses? Such a, a, a small uh, area. I mean, if we took this on a, on a large scale and you're proposing a significant amount of multifamily development versus single family, uh, yes, then we'd have a lot of planning issues uh, to wrestle with, no doubt. Um, but let's talk about this particular site, and let's talk about how we define density. I know how the state tells us we need to define density. They're telling us it's dwelling units per acre. I think most planners will tell you we try to move away from that when we talk about smaller lots, and that's because a five-bedroom house is one dwelling unit. A studio apartment is one dwelling unit. So they have the same impact? Well, of course not. They're totally different. So why do we keep using dwelling units per acre? It's not appropriate on a small size. How uh, about lot. bedrooms per acre? So that's where we go. We go to bedrooms per acre. Now, in this particular instance, we have three bedroom units times six is 18 bedrooms. And what really could be accomplished on three lots with single-family homes are probably five bedroom homes, so maybe 15 bedrooms versus 18 being proposed. So the resultant impact would not be significantly different. And I'm talking about every facet uh, that I described earlier when I talked about those uh, community impacts. Do you think it's likely that three 5,000 square foot five bedroom houses would be built on this land? Well, I said because of the local conditions, it's not likely, and that's why we're before the board tonight. <coughs> Okay. Um, I'm looking in my papers here. I think I left them back there. I need to introduce them to, through my witnesses anyway. Were you aware that this property was foreclosed on by its construction lender and also for failure to pay its property taxes? That's not a planning concern, so I'm not aware. I didn't uh, well, given, avail myself to that information. Given that you said the lack of development on this site, will, am I correct to understand that you at least attributed that somewhat to the idea that, well, no one's going to build three mansions here? that had nothing to do with finances, no. It had more to do with the fact that it's been vacant for a period of time. If there were development pressure, if there were a trend to build homes at this location, it probably would have happened at this time, after at least nine years and probably longer. I don't know the history prior to nine years, um, but that was my uh, testimony. Are you, a, are you a real estate professional? Uh, I'm not a real estate professional. Am I a real estate professional? No. I'm a, I'm a land use expert. Thank you. Okay. Mr. DeGrazio, one question I guess staff has raised. Um, does your witness know um, the date of the aerial photo? Do you think that this is a current photo or it, it is? It was taken, was it yesterday? Oh, you're talking no, about the no, aerial. No, I'm talking about in your exhibit. Oh, um, that's a Ooh, a, uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, you know what, generally they're pretty, uh, I, I mean, to be honest, in this area, probably the oldest Google ma map you'll see is from like 2013. In my experience, none of these aerial maps that you see from Google are older than three, three and a half years yeah, old. It's typical. Yeah, it's, it, it's not an old photograph. I, I was concerned because it, it doesn't look like the bank where you have bank labeled and it doesn't look like what was the restaurant where you have the, the commercial label. It, it looks much, much older. Yeah, this is a satellite taken from Google. Like 10 years ago. Maybe. Yeah, yeah it, it may have been taken off the internet some time ago. But, you know, generally speaking, they are up to date. If this one's out of date, uh, I apologize to the board. And uh, 
it, it just makes it difficult to then use that to compare the neighborhood when it's it's a little stale okay good so have we finished right, uh, with right. this aspect and can we go on to have them <laughs> Do you have another thought you would like to share? I assume the witness doesn't know it, but I just want to ask to Mr. Kalmbach, were you aware that that triangular area, which you would characterize as the townhouse development immediately up the street that we read the resolution for, were you aware that the master plan at that time had identified that particular parcel due to the layout of the streets around it, I think, as appropriate for high density? I, I am aware of that. And had they identified this property that way? Well, as I said earlier, I think my precise statement was the master plan doesn't touch <coughs> upon every single property in the township. And maybe if uh, during the planning board uh, subcommittee meeting somebody brought uh, attention to it, it may have been addressed at that time, but as it turns out, it wasn't. Okay, thank you. It wasn't. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So what I would like to do is to get members of the public to make the comments or ask questions as needed. Claudia has the list of in the order that people signed okay, up. Okay, so if, if you would care to read them. them out, we can hear them in that order. Sandra Chen of 51 Wilson Road. Sandra Chen. You'll have to Swear to be truthful and give Mr. your James. name and address so that we check it off properly on the list. Do you swear from your testimony this evening will be truthful? Yes, I do. Thank you. I am Sandra Chen, and my husband Ronald and I live at 51 Wilson Road. Uh, the back corner portion of our property touches on the lots in question tonight. Uh, I've been listening carefully to what was said, and I just have a few uh, matters I'd like to bring up. Um, I guess uh, one thing I would like to say is it seems to me that citizens, residents of a community should be able to count on zoning. We in the neighborhood know that it's single family zoned and this is represents a, a a change in our understanding of what's possible without going through a master plan uh, reconsideration process so i understand that if you do grant a, a variance for the zoning there has to be some very special consideration and Personally, I haven't heard tonight something that strikes me as a very special consideration. I think there could be that, but I, I haven't heard that tonight. Um, w one handicap I have is the plans have been revamped, and we haven't had a chance to really inspect the new plans, so if anything I'm saying is, out of touch, um, please excuse me. Um, one concern I have is the wetlands concern. Uh, the area, can I go yeah. over here? If you take the microphone with you. <laughs> um, am I, I guess I'm. You know, stand on the other side so we can see you. The, the lot that my husband and I, uh, our house is on, is this one here, which has this odd configuration, this sort of leg that goes over and joins the lots under consideration tonight. This leg area matches up with the smallest of the three lots that uh, they're requesting to have uh, re remapped. M um, and this is the area, I believe, of the wetlands. Now, this wetlands area... I think that's where the retention... Isn't that where the retention lays? This is Perhaps the wetlands? This is the characterized as the wetlands? 
because we get a lot of water here. It's mm -hmm. a low area at the back of our property. And if, if the wetlands on this property is filled in, I'm very concerned the impact that we carry over here. So this is not the area that's proposed to be filled in? Okay, that's misunderstanding on my part. In that area. I'm very surprised that this is not also a wetlands area because of it's a it's a ditch. This is the former trolley line that connected into Trenton. And um, this here you'll see there's some kind of right of way that goes across mm -hmm. the back of our property and continues on here into this small lot. I had assumed that the right of way continued all the way. And I had also thought that you couldn't build on these rights of way, but that's, I don't know that. I have no knowledge of that. I'm just really have been surprised in this process to hear that it could be considered a building area. This area is low and also does have, to me, wetlands characteristics. Um, I, under, I heard tonight that 40 trees are going to be removed. I, I, the planner referred to this unattractive void um, along 206, but I have to tell you, we as neighbors have appreciated the wooded vista from our back porches. So um, one person's unattractive void is another person's vista. But uh, also, I heard mention that there will be planting of trees. There was a lot of consideration apparently given to the appearance of the development along 206 and to the front. Uh, I heard of planting of trees along the roadway. Well, I, I don't know. There are mature trees on the property now. I, I doubt any of them would survive this development. I don't know that. Uh, and I don't know about tree planting plans for the back of the development, but uh, I do know that there are electric lines along 206, I believe, at that point. And so any tree planting would have to be of a scale and a type that wouldn't interfere with the electric lines there. Um, I don't know if any, there, uh, there's been a lot of presentation about screening and buffering uh, to the street, but I haven't heard any uh, discussion of screening or buffering of the development to, to those of us for whom this is our backyards. Um, um, and I guess the detention basin, this is probably uninformed, but uh, the detention basin, uh, I heard presentation tonight that the water in the detention basin would drain away within three days. Now, we all know that there's more and more mosquito-borne diseases, and so I just wonder, are we creating a neighborhood health hazard here with the nature of this detention basin? Uh, it's just a question. Of, I, of course, don't know the answer. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Who is the next person? Andrew and Debbie P Peace? Peel? Peel. Would you both like to testify? We'll just swear you in together. Sure. Yes, please. You swear or affirm your testimony this evening will be truthful. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Andrew and Debbie Peel. We're residents at 50 Wilson Road, um, so just across the street um, uh, behind uh, where the development will be. Um, we appreciate your time and hearing from us. We've got um, eight potential points just to raise for the, for the board. 
And my wife has several as well. Um, <laughs> Firstly, and these are in random order. Um, firstly, uh, as uh, we are uh, um, householders and, and owners here, we're very familiar with the commuting um, impact. And throughout the day, there is rush hour in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, and we're concerned that there was mention on a cursory basis about impact of traffic. But clearly, as we know on 206, with the bus, the traffic, the passenger cars, the, the um, uh, truck traffic, there are tailbacks regularly all the way down past the uh, former um, uh, Elements restaurant and uh, the site that in question. What kind of impact will having 21 potential additional cars tied to these three locations of duplex be getting in and out at rush hour in the midst of a tailback type of uh, congested area? I think it warrants additional traffic study explanation to, to talk about the flow of traffic in an already congested area. Secondly, um, as parents of uh, uh, two young children who were sensitive um, to traffic and automobiles being in the same place, we're talking about a duplex arrangement with six um, uh, duplex uh, units uh, and twice as many families than otherwise with single family homes. Where um, is there consideration for the play areas for those children, the walk areas, the pedestrian impact um, uh, in, a, in effect um, bordering on 206. Does that mean that there should be a crosswalk similar that exists today from Westcott across to the other side of the street up the hill? Or a stoplight. Or a stoplight. Will that further impact traffic? So you're there introducing- There are two crosswalks there already. Yes, you need another one with that many children. If that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So, so further down the hill where the, the entrance in and out of these um, uh, duplexes will be, we feel that with that many people, that many cars, and particularly family unit considerations, you could have a situation where you'll have children playing and then access across the street naturally to the park. Crosswalk would make sense or a stoplight. So again, warranting some study and consideration because they'd be trying to go to the pool and all the other places across the street track. Yep. Uh, additionally, with um, uh, the additional cars uh, on the site, um, more cars at 21 than the two car garages for each of the units, that means you have overflow car situations just parked in the back. Um, you're already talking about um, uh, an eyesore potential issue because there's no buffering in trees and screening. So additional potential cars, parking, and noise from that is something that we feel is uh, a particular concern. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Maybe you should put up a picture of the site with the... I, I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, I, so what I said was, you've done an excellent Is job. Is he swearing in? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Are you the applicant, sir? I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I think Chris was going to make a statement, so I just wanted to give him a chance to do that. Yeah, I was just... Sorry. I don't understand what you're trying to do. Well, it's a bit of an interruption. It is kind yeah. of rude. <laughs> Did you wait till uh, you were done? Sorry about that. Let's wait till you were finished. Could you wait until we were finished? Why don't you make a note and then ask us when we've finished instead of interrupting us? We have us. some people talking. You may not need to finish. Well, we have many points. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, should I? Well, just, uh, can, I, can I just make one point? The, re the reason I would you. suggest you may want to hold your comments is because of the announcement that Mr. DeGrezzi wants to make. And after that, if you want to finish your comments, I'm sure the, the board would allow that. So I don't Why, we we, why don't you explain, them? Mr. DeGrezzi, what it is you, you okay. want to do? Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, we've heard a lot of different concerns, a lot of testimony. We heard the points from the board. And my client wants to be a good neighbor. He doesn't want to, you know, clearly there's a lot of people that are upset with this approach. We thought that the diversity of housing stock was an important issue. It doesn't seem to be shared here. So we'll look at and we'll pull the application and come back with a fully, you know, like a, a, a single family home option. And, and I think the reason why I wanted to bring it up is because there's a list of 10 other people and it, instead of going through all of the, you know, we hear. So we're going to respect like that. You. Thank you. And we're going to respect What you have done is to withdraw your application. Exactly. Good. So you'll have to reschedule it 
in the no, normal we, we way can't, giving We can't even do that. Notice. We have to bring a separate application right. to exactly. the planning board or perfect our old subdivision if we're able yeah. to. Okay. But thank you. We appreciate the, the listening to the public. And like I said, we just want to respect their comments and. OK. So I guess then they, they've withdrawn their application. They're going to go away and prepare a new application. They're starting right from the beginning again, as I understand it. Ma'am, if you'd state your name for the record. Uh, Gail Denise. And uh, we'll just swear you in, just swear from your testimony this evening, we'll be truthful. Yes. Thank you. Be. Okay, I just wanted to remind you. And I I'm can't hear you. will have to walk, talk into is the it, Is it turned on? I just wanted to say that thank you for listening and thank you for withdrawing. And to rem I'm so glad that you remember that it was zoned R5. And that the three lots, three small houses, you know, they keep talking about 5,000 square foot houses, which are the McMansions that every single day we read about that we don't want in Princeton. So here we have three lots that could build maybe 3,500 square foot houses. And, you, and they may not make as much money, but we need those lots for those size houses. And if you look at some of the beautiful houses that are on Nassau Street, that are across from gas stations and from businesses, some people don't mind living across the street from a gas station. <laughs> and there's a good and, restaurant as and well. Some, or from a restaurant. And some people need lots for smaller size houses. We don't need 5,000 square foot houses good. everywhere. So Thank anyway. you very much. OK, so. We are adjourned. <laughs>